Hey friends, good morning. Happy Friday to you. Welcome to the Scripture Habit. My name is Rebecca Palmatier. I'm a pastor. I get to be a host here. I say welcome. I am excited for us to spend time together today. We're going to do it a little different today. I'll be honest because I'm moving pretty <laughs> stiff. It took me a while this morning uh, after a long night of running around with a bunch of elementary school students. So, But I'm excited to be here. We're going to read a couple of the Psalms aloud today and just talk about uh, two new writers that come to the scene. I'm going to wait just a second for friends who join us in the live to jump in and let me know that they're here. So we're going to wait just as, oh, like Darlene. Hey, Darlene, good morning. Uh, we're going to wait just a second, and uh, and then we'll get started together. I'm serious, Darlene, I'm so sore. <laughs> Not just from the running with the kids, but all day, like crouched down, filling like a thousand water, water balloons, and mm, I'm a little tired. Could use a massage. Ugh. <laughs> But I didn't want us to miss today, and so that's, I'd rather have us miss perhaps my notes on the screen um, and the scripture on the screen. I didn't have all the time to type it in this morning because I was running super slow, but oh, I still want us to get together. Hey, Gloria, good morning. Good morning. All right, let's pray. Let's pray, and then we're going to dig in. Good morning, God. Thank you so much for your presence. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. We really do. If we stop, we, the list of things to be thankful for continues. Let that stir in our heart today as we study your word, as we reflect on you and the journey of your people. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Okay, so today's Psalms <clears throat> were Psalms 85 to 89. I would like... <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to have us point out, I'm going to point out a few. I think it's always worth, every time we look at a psalm, we should get an idea. Who's the writer? Are there any specific time frames that lead to us knowing when the psalm is? I'm going to have us just point out a few with the 85, 86. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um... I'm going to actually have us read 86 because it's David's psalm. It's actually the only psalm of David in our selection. And then I want us to talk about 88 and 89, if we can do that. Hey, Suzanne, good morning. So real quick, so I'm not going to have the words on the screen today, and I apologize. I'm going to be grabbing my Bible. We're going to look at it together this way. Psalm 85, I just want to point out that it's written by the sons of Korah. All right? Psalm 85 is called Restoration of Favor. We do not know the time frame, the exact time frame of this psalm. But let's look at 86. I want to read it. 86 is a psalm of David. And in this particular book, um, book two, and by the way, uh, going to Psalm 89 ends reading book, I'm sorry, book three. In this, we see a lot of other writers instead of David. So I'm looking and seeing, okay, we have this whole kind of period of Asaph, sons of Korah. We're going to see two guys come in today, uh, Haman and Ethan. Uh, and then we see this one of David in the middle. So let's take a read, shall we? Psalm 86 is called Lament and Petition. It does not give a time. Listen, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Protect my life, for I am faithful. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Be gracious to me, Lord, for I call on you all day long. Bring joy to your servant's life, because I appeal to you, Lord. For you, Lord, are kind and ready to forgive, abounding in faithful love to all who call on you. Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my plea for mercy. I call on you in the day of my distress, for you will answer me. I love his confidence there. Verse 8. Good morning, Stephanie. Lord, there is no one like you among the gods, and there are no works like yours. All the nations you have made will come and bow down before you, Lord, and will honor 
your name, for you are great and perform wonders. You alone are God. I love that he has that image there. All the nations you've made will come and bow down before you, Lord, right? And honor your name. Reminds me of the scripture that, you know, one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that you are Lord. Here we see David's similar vision, sentiment. Verse 11. Teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. Give me an undivided mind to fear your name. I will praise you with all my heart, Lord my God, and will honor your name forever. For your faithful love for me is great, and you rescue my life from the depths of Sheol. I think that that one phrase at the end of 11 is a prayer that I, I like that phrasing, Lord, give me an undivided heart. Give me an undivided heart. I mean, an undivided mind. Whether that's um, not being distraction and pulled by 20 other different things, or even more so, have a heart that is solely focused and engaged in loving and honoring and serving the Lord, instead of being divided between, all right, here's the period of my day where I'm seeking God, and here's the period of my day where I'm, you know, living it up. Not that living it up is bad, but like uh, feeding flesh, feeding self, or this other part of the day where it feels really disjointed, you know? Having an undivided mind means that it's consistent and whole. It's not fractured. It just hits me today. Yeah. Lord, help us have an undivided mind, right? And David says why? to fear your name. And fear isn't just a scarcity. Um, Fear is also a reverence and a recognition and a submission to the name, which the name of God is the authority of God, recognizing his full power, his dominion. Yeah, love it. The last few verses of this Psalm, verses 14 through 17, there is a shift. There's a shift, I think, in the tone. And interesting, to me, this is a flip of what David usually does. Often David starts out and he's pouring out the concern of his heart and he's wrestling with being able to trust God. And then he gets to that point of remembering who God is, right? This is backwards. Because we see that this whole space before has been like this devotion and recognition of God's greatness. And then we see here, let's read it. Verse 14 to 17, only four verses out of the whole thing. God, arrogant people have attacked me. A gang of ruthless men intends to kill me. They do not let you guide them. But you, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give me, I'm sorry, give your strength to your servant. Save the son of your female servant. Show me a sign of your goodness. My enemies will see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped and comforted Just pointing out as well, did you notice verse 16? David acknowledges that his mom has been a faithful servant of God. His mom probably poured into David this heart to love and trust the Lord. Beautiful, yeah. That's Psalm 86, and it's written by David. And I resonate with his heart. And again, I love that he's modeling to us how to come to God. And it's not, it's not having to craft uh, phrases that sound eloquent, although some people are really gifted in that, and it just kind of flows naturally from their mouth. But it's, it's saying, hey, you can be honest with God, with your feelings. You can be honest with God about the reality of where you are in the moment, and then work through it with him. Work through it with him. Remember, wrestle, submit, trust. Yeah. All right. Let's skim 87 real quick. I'm just going to point it out. It says, Zion, the city of God. And this is another psalm written by the sons of Korah. And remember, 
Zion represents two things. Zion can represent um, the city of God. Zion can also represent Jerusalem. All right? And this one is a short one. I'm going to go ahead and have us move to 88. Is that good? Stephanie. All right. Psalm 88 is going to introduce a new guy to the scene. We're not going to read all of 88 and all of 89, but I want to point them out to you. And then I think maybe we will come back to 87 and we'll read it to close out. All right. Psalm 88 is called Cry of Desperation. It's a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah for the choir director, according to Mahalath Leonath, a mass skill of Heman the Ezra, Ez, Ezraite. Okay, so it's saying it's a psalm of the sons of Korah, and then it specifically mentions one guy by name. This guy, Heman, the Ezraite, we know that he's a singer. He's one of David's singers. But what we gather by this psalm is that it's in a later period. All right, he mentions David. Let's see how it starts out. He says this. Lord God of my salvation, I cry out before you day and night. May my prayer reach your presence. Listen to my cry. For I have had enough troubles and my life is near Sheol. I am counted among those going to the pit, down to the pit. I'm like a man without strength, abandoned and among the grave, whom you no longer remember, who are cut off from your care. We know that God remembers, right? The word that I think best describes this psalm and actually the tone of the one that comes after it as well is called despondent. Despondent. It's a moment where you question and feel if God is still with you or not. Now listen, I know there are moments where people will feel that, right? The reality of things are very heavy and you are super discouraged, wondering, God, why haven't you shown up and taken care of this yet? Start to question. I love that the psalm is included in scripture because again, it's, it's real. It's real. We get to see people wrestling. Again, psalms is a book of writings. We don't approach psalms or quote psalms or uh, claim psalms in the same way that we would other passages of scripture and other promises of God. It's different. There are some psalms I've mentioned that um, foretell or foreshadow the coming of the Messiah. That's awesome. But then there are psalms like this where you just you see people are just wrestling and they're like, God, why aren't you answering yet? Where are you? Are you? Do you even see us? Do you even remember us? Do you even care? That's this song. Now I see if you if you skip to verse 13, there is a bit of a beat change. All right. He says, but after he's laid out the saying about how I've been put in the depths of the pit, I'm going down. My friends have turned on me. I seem repulsive to everybody. I'm all alone. It's desperate, right? Verse 13, he says, but. But I call to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer meets you. Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me? From my youth, I've been suffering and near death. I suffer your horrors. I am desperate. Your wrath sweeps over me. So you see, he's still wrestling. But you can see there's that little bit of like inner fight, trying to cling or hold. Verse 18 is how it ends. And look at this. The writer says, you have distanced, you have distanced loved one and neighbor from me. Darkness is my only friend. To me, that sounds like deep depression, doesn't it? And we know with mental health that sometimes when we, when we experience very difficult things, um, it would be expected or anticipated to wrestle with feeling like you're in a very dark place. I do love 
that we don't end here. <laughs> let's go ahead. Let's look at Psalm 89. We're going to talk a little bit more about the context or the timing of this one. And then I want us to go back to 87 and close out. Psalm 89, I love the title. It says, Perplexity About God's Promises. So it's wrestling. Like both of these, you'd think that they're supposed to be exciting psalms, right? But they're not. They're lamenting psalms. They're wrestling psalms. And in Psalm 89, it says that the writer is Ethan, at Ezra Height, and it's a maskil. Remember maskil? Uh, maskil is, is this writing of wisdom. Ethan is also one of David's singers. We see their names mentioned as sons um, from uh, Korath, Korah, I forget the exact name, but basically under the sons of Korah, under that umbrella. All right. This is how he opens up. I will sing about the Lord's faithful love forever. I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations with my mouth. For I will declare, faithful love is built up forever. You establish your faithfulness in the heavens. Verse 3. The Lord said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build up your throne for all generations. Selah. Pause. We read that opening and we're like, yeah, jubilant, right? It continues in verse three. Lord, the heavens praise your wonders, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can compare to the Lord? Who among the heavens, I'm sorry, who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? God is greatly feared in the council of holy ones, more awe-inspiring than all who surround him. Lord God of armies. So Lord God of armies is that title, um, like Lord of the heavenly host, the one that leads the charge of God's armies, right? Lord God of armies, who is strong like you, Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the raging sea. When its waves surge, you still them. To me, foreshadow, I think of the scene where Jesus calms the sea. Yeah. Here's where I want to point out. This psalm is a longer psalm. We're not going to read every verse. Um, I love verse 14 and 15. Actually, let's pick up 13. 13, you have a mighty arm. Your hand is powerful. Your right hand is lifted high. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Happy are the people who know the joyful shout. Lord, they walk in the light from your face. They rejoice in your name all day long and they're exalted by your righteousness. For you are their magnificent strength. Surely our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, the Holy One of Israel. All of these words, all right, all of these words sound amazing. In the next section, he continues to mention things uh, about the covenant and the commitment that God has made to his people. For example, uh, verse 20, I have found David my servant. I have anointed him with sacred oil. My hands will always be with him. My arm will strengthen him. The enemy will not oppress him. The wicked will not afflict him. I will crush his foes before him and strike those who hate him. My faithfulness will be with him through my name and his horn will be exalted. All right. Verse 28. I will always preserve my faithful love for him and my covenant with him will endure. I will establish his line forever and his throne as long as heaven lasts. Again, still praise. Like God, these are the things, these are the promises, the commitments, the beauty, the strength of your covenant that you've given your people. All right. He says, this is beautiful too. Uh, look at verse 30. If his sons abandon my instruction and do not live by my ordinances, if they dishonor my statutes and do not keep my commands, then I will call their rebellion 
to account with the rod, their iniquity with blows, verse 33, but I will not withdraw my faithful love from him or betray my faithfulness. This is, they're calling on the things that God has said, right? Another thing, verse 34, I will not violate my covenant or change what my lips have said. Once and for all, I've sworn an oath by my holiness. I will not lie to David. His offspring will continue forever. His throne like the sun before me, like the moon established forever, a faithful witness in the sky. Selah. Powerful, beautiful proclamations of God's relationship with his people, his commitment, his covenant, his word, right? This is where the title or the concept, the theme of perplexion of God's promises comes. Because God has spoken these things. And yet, the writer Ethan, he's writing this in the time when Absalom, Solomon's, I'm sorry, David's, oh man, David or Solomon's son. Hold up. I'm having a brain lapse. I don't want to say it wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's Absalom's rebellion. It contrasts the promise, prosperity, and perpetuity of David's throne at a time when God appeared to have forgotten his covenant. There it is. I'm quoting, by the way, that's from uh, the JFB, the critical commentary and explanatory of the whole Bible. That's a, a commentary. Okay, so this is where the beat change happens. Take a look at verse 38. After he's quoted all of these declarations of God's faithfulness to David and to David's descendants, he says this, but you have spurned and rejected him. You've become enraged with your anointed. You have repudiated the covenant with your servant. You have completely dishonored his crown. You've broken down all his walls. You've reduced his fortified cities to ruin. All who pass by plunder him. He's become an object of ridicule to his neighbors. You've lifted high the right hand of his foes. You've made all his enemies rejoice. You've also turned back his sharp sword and have not let him stand in battle. You've made his splendor cease and overturned his throne. You have shortened the days of his youth. You've covered him with shame. Verse 46, how long, Lord, will you hide forever? Will your anger keep burning like a fire? Remember how short my life is. Have you created everyone for nothing? What courageous person can live and never see death? Who can save himself from the power of Sheol? Lord, where there are former acts of your faithful love that you swore to David in your faithfulness, where? Remember, Lord, the ridicule against your servants. In my heart, I carry abuse from all peoples. How your enemies have ridiculed, Lord. How they've ridiculed every step of your anointed. And then verse 52, the last phrase that closes out this this. Uh, not Jekyll and Hyde Psalm, but it's like it, it's got both extremes, right? This is how it ends it out. Verse 52 is a standalone by itself. Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. As we read that, uh, there's some images in my mind of, of friends that I've met over the years who are in this state. They've experienced miraculous power they have they have had passion and and like zeal for god they've witnessed god do miracles but then an extended season of pain of um rejection has stirred up bitterness and they question if god's words are really faithful because it doesn't look or feel like it I think sometimes as Christians, you and I don't like, or we don't feel comfortable with people when they're in that state. It makes us feel 
awkward. And in the back of, of the mind, probably the question is, well, what if God doesn't show up? What if God isn't faithful? You know? And I, I think, honestly, that, that our, us as a church, we do a disservice when we try to quiet people when they're in this state. We quiet them because it doesn't feel good. We quiet them because we don't want them to rub off on other people. We don't want, you know, we don't want their depression or questioning or whatever to spread, you know, which is foolish. It's foolish. But that's how humans usually react when another person around them is deep in suffering. I want to, I just want to encourage you today not to do it. Listen, if that was a bad model that we were supposed to strike down, why would it be included here? I'm just saying that, right? Again, Psalms allows us the space to come before God completely raw and honest. And I think, hey, just like this person, the fact that they are trying to wrestle with the reality that is tough, the fact that they're trying to bring their questions to God, to me, that means there's still hope. That means there's a sliver of hope that is still there. Let someone have that. If you cut them off, what are you doing to them? You know? I don't know. I, I just felt that in my spirit, that we need to say that. You know, sometimes the best thing we could do when someone is in a state like this is not to say anything, not to chide them for their dark and difficult thoughts, but just to sit with them, to acknowledge the awful and say, yeah. I see that friend. And in those moments where they're wrestling with the nature of God, you can say, yes, God has been faithful. And his word does say, his word does say that he will remain faithful. He will not turn back on his covenant, that God is not a liar. You know, these things encourage that, but don't smack someone's hand or shut them down because they have difficult feelings. God's shoulders are big enough for that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's 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 the word for today. Let's go ahead and let's finish up on 87. It's a short psalm, only seven verses. We'll read it together as we close out. Zion, the city of God. It's a psalm of the sons of Korah. And it's actually, they specifically say, a song. The city he founded is on the holy mountains. The Lord loves Zion's city gates more than any dwell of the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things are said about you, city of God. I will make a record of those who know me. Rahab, Babylon, Philistia, Tyre, Cush, each one was born there. And it will be said of Zion, this one and that one were born of her. The Most High himself will establish her. When he registers the peoples, the Lord will record... This one was born there. Singers and dancers alike will say, my whole source of joy is in you. That's it. Selah. The question that I'll leave us with on that is, which, which Zion do you think that the writer is speaking of in that moment? Which one? When he's talking about all these other people, people even from Philistia, Tyre, Cush, all of the people, um, uh, Rahab, Babylon, saying at the end of the day, these people originated from this other Zion. Yeah, let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your faithfulness to be with us. Thank you, God, that your spirit gives life to our body. <clears throat> Lord, you can soothe even aching muscles and tired and weary souls. Such is the beauty of your presence, the gift that comes just from sitting in your space. God, for anyone today who might be in the depth of darkness, who might be struggling with difficult things and asking questions, Lord, I thank you that your spirit meets them where they are, that you, God, hold space with them, that you're even just a sliver of hope, a little bit of light, that it would begin to come in and cut through the darkness. But God, I pray that you would use us, the others in the group, use us as instruments of your peace today. Use us as instruments of love and compassion. Help us meet people where they are. Help us hold space 
with them as well. We love you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Thank you. It is Friday. Thank you for letting us do that without words on the screen today. I'm sorry for that adjustment, but I thought, you know, I still want us to meet together and read, so we're going to do it. All right, do me a favor. Hit the share button. Invite someone into the Bible study, into this process. I will post up the scriptures for next week, uh, the readings that you'll do. I hope you'll take a look over the weekend. All right, have a great day, guys. Love you.